Can we get a break from a negative Arizona Cardinal story? Nope. You are locked on Cardinals. Your daily Arizona Cardinals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Locked On Cardinals. Alex Clancy here. Follow me on Twitter at Clancy's Corner. Follow the podcast at Locked On AC Cards. Thanks for making Locked On Cardinals your first listen each and every day. You can hear that I'm just defeated. You can hear that I'm defeated. Uh, please go and like this and subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. We've got a jam show. I was super excited uh, to introduce Keith Sanchez, now part of Locked On NFL Draft, also with the Draft Network, is going to join me. We we're going to do a full show. I'm now cutting that down to two segments as uncertainty around reports circling the Arizona Cardinals. Again, takes center stage so the report if you haven't seen it there are multiple reports out there i'm getting mike sando on from the athletic tomorrow who wrote about it as well so please be sure to tune into that he's one of the best in the business but i'm reading verbatim the first two paragraphs of adam adam schefter's article on espn arizona cardinals owner michael bidwell is accused of gross misconduct including cheating discrimination and harassment in an arbitration claim filed tuesday by former Cardinals executive Terry McDonough to NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell. McDonough maintained that both he and former Cardinals head coach Steve Wilkes were left with no choice but to follow Bidwell's plan to use burner phones to communicate with former Arizona GM Steve Kime while Kime was serving a five-week suspension after pleading guilty to extreme DUI in Arizona. Those are just the first two paragraphs. So, as rational people like you and I are, Let's take a beat, wait for this to, you know, grow a little bit or be placated. The Cardinals obviously came out and said it's, you know, completely untrue, paraphrasing. And Terry McDonough has had issues in the past. It's just like, I can't help but think. Last few months, Steve Kime getting fired. Did they know this was coming? I, like, I don't, again, I don't know. Did Michael Bidwell get so far ahead of it? He knew what was coming down the pike that that's why he did what he did. It was, it forced his hand. It wasn't actually the play on the field. And the, and the decision Steve Kime made. And, if you think for one second that Michael Cap- Michael Bidwell isn't capable of this after he was the one that laid down the suspension for Steve Kime, why would why would he be the one to give burners to people? Because he didn't think he was going to get caught, if it's true. Because he can't run an organization on his own. He doesn't know what he's doing. So those two things, if both of those things were reactionary to this report coming out, Steve Kahn getting fired, and then the the conversation about why would he give burners if he was the one giving the suspension. It's an inside job. It's it's thinking, thinking you're smarter than the game. Now, with all of that, I did want to take this segment to kind of like not be tongue-in-cheek, not be combative, There's time for that. I feel bad for the fans. The fans deserve better. And while I'm sure there's going to be flags raised for sell the team and, you know, this is Daniel Snyder part two, we'll see about the harassment and misconduct because I do not take that stuff lightly when talking about this, even though I, you know, I focus mainly on the football aspect of it, but sometimes it bleeds over. And if things come out, a la, and this I'm not comparing the two because two different organizations, two different people, comparing, you know, I, you know, with what happened with Robert Sarver in Phoenix, it's like the state of Arizona just needs a hard reset, as the Cardinals themselves do. And if this leads to further ramifications for Michael Bidwell, we can talk about it then. 
But as of now, I just I feel bad for the fans who have been around for a long time. I feel bad for the players because, remember, they're human beings also. I, I feel bad for, you know, kind of feel bad for Monty Austin Ford and Jonathan Gannon. I just feel bad. <laughs> and, you know, if if you're an Arizona Cardinal loather or you've, you know, you're a spurned fan, I get it. This is fuel to the fire. But while people are already taking sets, oh, that can't be true. Or, oh, it's obviously true. It's just like people don't report things like, like it's been less than a day. Letting the day play out. Mike Sando's going to join me tomorrow from The Athletic. We are going to talk about it then. But I did want to at least obviously acknowledge it. I'm not going to do a whole I'm not going to do a whole show on it. You can find people prognosticating about what could potentially happen elsewhere. I'm just reporting what was reported yesterday. And let's take kind of a wait and see approach here at least for a day. Because this is a very slippery slope, regardless of if you think Michael Bidwell should be the owner or not, and you can't just oust owners because you don't like them. Now, if things like this transpire, it's a different conversation. But kind of got to let things play out, see where this goes, and have conversations then. Because this is a very, very serious situation. And it's got to be handled with, you know, gloves instead of just a hammer beating people in, in, in the idea that, oh, that's it. Get rid of them. Make them sell it. We don't know what's, we don't know what's happening yet. We know the reports. We know that they refuted the reports. That's what we know. All in all, though, I do. The fans don't deserve this. The fans don't deserve this, and the potential, you know, ripple effect for this is something that's kind of out of the purview of rational thought right now because we don't know where this could end. We know the former executive made very jarring accusations towards Michael Bidwell. Um, and I will just implore you, you know, I have you, I challenge you to think outside the box here. Just because Michael Biddle was the one that laid down the suspension for one of his best friends, Steve Kime, after his extreme DUI, when, mind you, he impersonated and said he was a security officer for the Arizona Cardinals and not the GM to a, to a police officer. He was head of security. Okay. Just because Michael Bidwell laid down the suspension doesn't mean it's outside of his guys or purview to give burners to coaches so he could talk to the GM because he doesn't know how to run a damn organization. Before yesterday, damn it, we were on a positive trajectory. All things lead to opportunities for the Cardinals with Steve Kime and Cliff Kingsbury gone. Let's pretend that article didn't come out yesterday. That report didn't come out yesterday. We're going to talk about the draft. Key Sanchez part of the 2019 LSU National Championship team on the sideline, one of the best collections of talent we've ever seen. He knows so much more about the draft than I do. It's gross. So I'm going to talk to him next. Locked on Cardinals, your team every day. First, FanDuel. This episode of Locked on Cardinals is brought to you by the aforementioned FanDuel. The NBA playoffs are almost here. Now's the perfect time to download FanDuel America's number one sportsbook because – New customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line, point scores, threes drain. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So don't miss the chance to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets. When you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Really stoked to get this guy in here. 
Keith, Coach Keith Sanchez at the Talent Code, Senior Draft Analyst for the Draft Network. How's it going, man? Man, I'm good, man. Excited to be on Locked On Cardinals with my guy, Alex Clancy, man. I mean, I'm, here, I'm here's good the thing. This good. Locked On NFL Draft. I mean, you're home now. Yes. Okay, you're home. I don't know where you've been. You're home now. Uh, there are um, so many different potentials for the Arizona Cardinals at number three overall. I think that's pretty obvious. And my burning question, I've had – you know, your co-host on Dame uh, last yeah. week. And I have this existential internal crisis debate with myself. Let me ask you this straight up. Is Will Anderson that much better than other pass rushers, edge rushers that have come out over the last couple of years that would yield the Cardinals to need to take him unless they get a King's Ransom to trade down? As a pass rusher, no, but I, I think what you have to understand with drafting Will Anderson, and, and I heard the, the back end of your, you know, what you were just discussing with the Arizona Cardinals, right? I, Will Anderson brings more than just a skill set. He okay. brings a mentality. He brings turning over a locker room. He brings playing hard in practice. He brings, he he, he sets a, a, a championship level standard, right? And that was something we always talked about LSU, right? Like you want to set a standard for excellence for yourself. And you bring in a player like that, who just came from Alabama, which you watch on film, he gives it every single play, right? When they see the number one, what the number third overall pick playing this hard, then your fifth round that has no choice but to play that hard, right? And we have to understand this, man, and, and being in those locker rooms. Players are people too, right? So mm -hmm. when you're three and three and you're like, oh, man, this is going down the drain, they may not play 100% and give it all, right? That's why they say they have regular season speed, they have playoff speed, and they have champion Super Bowl speed, right? But you want one of those players that's going to make your other players feel guilty about not playing that hard, man. So I think when you draft Will Anderson, of course, he's a supreme talent. If you're asking me if, as a pass rusher, he's so much exponentially better than any other pass rusher that we've ever seen, the answer to that is no. But he's a high level pass rusher. Plus, you're getting the integrity as a football person, a football character. And I think it fits in well with what the Cardinals need. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, Key Sanchez, uh, Draft Network, Locked On NFL Draft, here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day at the talent code on Twitter. Like, I get that. And one thing that I've mentioned a lot about the Cardinals, and I think it's pretty obvious, I'm not Albert Einstein for saying this, but they need pillars for this organization. They've got yes. Buda Baker. And that's it on defense. Like, set and forget. You know exactly what you're going to get every week. Now, Zayvon Collins had a good second year. Isaiah Simmons, they still don't know where to put him on the field, which is Hassan Reddick 2.0 just in my blood. Just watching <laughs> it happen. They need to pick up Isaiah Simmons' fifth-year option yesterday and have that extra year to kind of cultivate him, especially with Jonathan Gannon and Nick Rowles calling the shots now. But they need guys. Okay, so that's why, as you mentioned, that's great. You know, culture – foundation like steve keim put band-aids and crazy glue over the massive cracks in the foundation by trading for you know veteran players mostly on offense but bringing in guys paying them too much and watching them go elsewhere to all sugs and win the super bowl midseason like that that's what the cardinals have done with the trade back though and I, we're going to talk more in depth about this next segment but like we can't help but think if you can get one a player at three regardless of how strong he is in between the years culturally and on the field you could get over two years three or four a minus players and wouldn't that be kind of with where the cardinals are now wouldn't that benefit the roster a little bit more or is this one where it's like you see them you take them you worry about everything else later yeah, I mean, I, I so I think there's an argument for both sides, right? And you know, it brings into context, okay, what is where is all of the talent pool in this draft, right? Because it's all about drafting and finding great value for your picks, right? And and I always tell um, my listeners that locked on NFL draft, every draft is not created equal, meaning that your, your number one edge rusher in this class is not as talented as the number one edge rusher in the next class, right? So you, you have to look at it that way, that every draft pick is not created equal. And I think that this, that if, if the Cardinals are going to trade back and acquire more picks, I think that's fine, right? But the question is this. Do you want picks in this draft? Which, I'll be honest, when I watch them, I, I know you said A-plus and A-minus. I think they're probably about seven to eight A-plus guys. And then I think you go to 
B plus, right? I'm not sure okay. how many A minus guys. So maybe if you're thinking with strategy, right, and they have you know new front office and GM and everything, maybe you're thinking, okay, it matter of fact, instead of 2023 compensation, we want 2024 compensation, right? Because that draft appears to be much more deeper. So there are so many different levels and nuances that go into you know trading back because you have to actually judge the class for what it's worth. But I, if they take Will Anderson, I'm not mad at it at all. If they take, if they decide to trade back because there's so many holes on this team and they want to continue to fill it out. I completely understand that too. And we have to take into account this part too, that Kyler Murray obviously was the ACL injury, right? And he's probably not going to play much this year. So what do you do? Do you worry about building everything else out so that when Kyler Murray comes back, he can step right in to a much better situation? That could be part of your thought process too, um, you know, if you're the general manager and the head coach. I wasn't going to do this, Key Sanchez, but I'm going to do it now, and I'm going to backload all the rest of the draft talk. Coming out of college, what did you think of Kyler Murray? I thought Kyler Murray was is an explosive player. Um, obviously, he can use his legs to make plays. I thought he was a, a, a they're really good at doing off script things, right? Like like playing out of structure, right, and just kind of doing some backyard football type things. But I think. Um, he has a good arm for, you know, for his size, right? Because he is, you know, of the smaller, but he has a good arm. He can make plays. And I'll say this, from what I've seen with Kyler Murray, and I know we, we're just about to take this conversation, right? What I've seen with Kyler Murray is that if you ask me if he's good enough to win playoff games with, I think he is. When I watched the Arizona Cardinals in, last, not this past year, but year before, right? When they made the playoffs and they played the Los Angeles Rams. If you paid attention to the game, that was when Sean McVay had Matthew Stafford, right? And that was Matthew Stafford's first playoff game with the Los Angeles Rams. What Sean McVay did was run the football because early on, Matthew Stafford was not playing well, right? Like you can tell the jitters and the nerves got to him. And that's what I try to tell people, like players are human too. Like they yeah. know the moment too. And some of them don't respond. And Sean McVay seen it, right? And so he started to run the football, take a more balanced approach until his quarterback got all the way comfortable. Now, the um cliff kingsbury kyler murray situation it seemed as though it was like okay look this is our identity and a refusal to try to balance it right it was like kyler murray more kyler murray receiver oh let's go get another one okay yeah let's get another fast right receiver there was no balance in that right to take it off of a young quarterback shoulders to kind of balance that thing out and that was just a snapshot of what i've seen because you know i've watched cardinals and i'm not going to pretend that I watched all 17 games, right? Yeah. But what I watched, and I remember that key moment, just watching it from my eye with my experience, I was like, that was a key moment to our seeing how that thing operates in Arizona, and it's not a balanced approach. Yeah, and the reason why I asked you that, because we didn't prep that prep that question. The reason why I asked that is because people from a national perspective, people from scouting perspective, people from outside of the, you know, the bubble that is Arizona, I yeah. like to get their knee-jerk natural response to a question about something that I've talked about pretty much every day for the last four years that uh, Kyler Murray wins in spite of Cliff Kingsbury, not because of him. And I feel like he's been just held back. And listen, Kyler Murray's not without fault. Kyler Murray threw that underhand interception for the pick mm -hmm. six. Kyler yep. Murray has some been great. Kyler Murray's got some growing up to do. All of those things are true. And he's had zero guidance, in my opinion, at an NFL level necessary to elevate a quarterback to elite level, which is what we saw for the first half of 2021 when everything was going great for the Cardinals. Yeah, and no, a lot I, of that. I, I agree. But, like, it's 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 some of the things are laughable, right? Like, even like the contract situation, right, with the Call of Duty stuff, like, getting out. Like, I, I don't know how that type of information gets out. And I've worked behind those walls, right? Nine times out of ten, the only stuff that gets out are the stuff that's told to get out. That's just what it is. We have our team reporters. We have the people that we tell specific stuff to let out. And I'm thinking from – uh, owner slash head coach slash GM, like why would you even let that type of information out? Because it's so hard, especially when you're trying to keep a fan base engaged, right? If you're the owner or the general manager, you're trying to keep your faith and the head coach and everything. It's so hard to keep your fans coming to the stadium or keep them believing when you have things like that, right? It was just really immature, like in into not even to defend Kyler Murray, but just talking, right? These guys. They play video games like they play. That's that's what happens now. Hopefully he's not playing video games at the the I guess, you know, the I guess compromise of studying his his practice film. But for right. things like that to get out, man, that's that, that was that was ridiculous. 
And and we and on top of that, you know, the the study clause and all that stuff. Like, just yeah. in, and part of that, it's just I agree. With, like, this is and what's coming out now. I'm not. I I refuse to do that for more than a segment today because it's all prognosticating. But uh, Key Sanchez at the Talent Code Draft Network, locked on NFL Draft. We're gonna hit the draft hard. How far back can the tr- can the Cardinals trade back and still get an impact player? And just like I talked with Trevor Sikama yesterday, I'm gonna run my idea past somebody much smarter than me as it pertains to the draft and. He's going to let me know what he thinks. Alex Clancy, Lock on Cardinals. We'll be right back. Alex Clancy, Locked on Cardinals. Follow me on Twitter, Clancy's Corner. Follow the podcast at Locked on AZ Cards. Please like, subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. At the talent code, Keith Sanchez, senior draft analyst for the Draft Network, the Paige DeMacos Project. Tell her she owes me a damn interview. I, well, I haven't reached out to her, so that's that's my bad. I, no, wait, I, know. I, I, I I'm love definitely, Paige. I'm definitely going to tell you that. I would yeah, tell her later, and you know she lives in the Arizona area. Yeah. She's so passionate about it. Like we were just talking about some of these topics yesterday, so she more than happy. I'm definitely gonna tell her. Yeah, tell her, tell her. I owe her a call, so I'll, I'll I'll reach out to her. But yeah, no, tell her I've been thinking about her, and I'd love to get her back on. So three. So let's talk about trade down packages first. That will kind of transition into players the Cardinals could take at those positions. So the easy one is if Indy wants to move up, give the Cardinals a second or third round pick in 2023. You draft Will Anderson at four, like. The thing is with this is the Cardinals need another tango partner with Indy for this to maximize the potentials, Anthony Richardson, the guy, things like that. Like, first off, do you think that there is going to be a team just like San Francisco did two years ago? It's like here, all of our draft capital to move up outside the top 10 to three. Like, is Tennessee really an option to move up to three with the Garbaggio roster they have right now? Yeah, I'm- <laughs> Are they really an option? I think so. Should they be an option? No. Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that roster, and we just talked about it on Locked On NFL Draft. Matter of fact, it's the episode that comes out today. Uh, we Sweet. talked about it yesterday. That that roster is not – like, they, they shouldn't do it. They just hold on to your draft picks, sit it out. I know you want to get in the party. It's not your time to party, man. Just sit down. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I definitely don't think the Tennessee Titans should do it. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, especially with what's coming around the corner for the top two picks next year could garner like – and another reason why with the Cardinals – I'm jumping around a little bit, but why I'm kind of starry-eyed on the Cardinals trading back is if it's the Raiders, if it was Detroit for a second, if it was you know Tennessee, that has another lotto ticket for the Cardinals for the Caleb Williams sweepstakes next year. Like a rookie quarterback definitely can end – a season with the team having the number one overall pick or the number two overall pick. So with the Cardinals probably losing Kyler Murray for the majority of the season and then having another lotto ticket, it's like you could get transcendent amount of draft picks or draft Caleb Williams and trade Kyler Murray. Like it opens up the world to a team that was in the doldrums to the, to the penthouse within a couple of seasons. You're, right? you're sitting I mean, right, yeah. You're sitting right in the same situation that Chicago was sitting in, right? Where you you have a presumably franchise quarterback, young guy on a rookie contract, and then now you have the opportunity to trade the number one overall pick, or you can go with the number one overall pick and trade Kyler Murray. So, I mean, I, I'm with you. Now, <clears throat> I think that's what needs to be applied to the Cardinals. Like, let's let's take a step back, right? Like you're talking about the GM and the head coach, and let's worry about doing this thing the right way mm-hmm. over two, three years. And I, and I know everybody wants to win now, but I always say this, when we won our championship in 2019, that was not 2019. That was the work we did in 2017. That was the work we did in 2018. Everything came together in that 2019, 2020 season. So we have to, you know, the Cardinals, if you're in a rebuild, it's like, okay, look, let's make sure that we make calculated decisions and then we'll move forward with that. Let me ask you a question. I mean, we can talk about this all day. What was it like watching Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson on the same field? Like, I know everybody asks you this. I don't care. I'm being selfish. Like, what what, what was that? Probably the best offense we've ever seen in college football, at least numbers-wise. Like, what was that like just in practice? Like, how do you push guys like that? How do you – or I know they push themselves. I know they're elite athletes. I can get all that. But, like, what the hell? How do you get every – like, CEH and – like, how does that happen? Yeah, I mean, it it, go, it starts with this side of what we're talking about, right? For, for the NFL, it's the draft for college, right? It's recruiting and, and acquiring that talent um, and, you know, like doing the film, doing the homework, making sure you're getting the right guys and practice. Man, you're talking about beautiful things, man. So <laughs> this was, and I'm being honest, so this was Derek Stingley's freshman year uh-huh. and he was an early enrollee. So he was there doing spring ball, right? And we practiced in the stadium before the game. So like every Saturday we were treated like a game heading into the actual spring game so we it's a saturday practice 
in Baton Rouge. It's 90 degrees outside, right? It's offense versus defense. You know, you have people going at it. And this was Jamar Chase, obviously, breakout season, like him going into that season. But he was a freshman the year before. Relatively, like people knew him but didn't know him, right? And, and Jamar Chase is getting after Derek Stingley, right? And, and they going back and forth, and the DB coach getting on Derek Stingley, telling him, how the hell are you letting Jamar Chase do it? It sounds crazy now, right? Like, how the hell are you letting Jamar Chase do that to you? But, you know, they going back and forth, man. And then the last play of the game, they put all the marbles on the table. I forgot for who was going to win the scrimmage. Boom, Derek Stingley battles back, comes up with the interception to end the game. He takes his helmet off, and that's when he has the bush and everything, everybody <laughs> going crazy. So you're just talking about some epic battles, man. It, it's been so many times I've seen Derek Stingley go against uh, Jamar Chase, seen Grant Delpit go against Justin Jefferson. I have Patrick Queen going against Clyde <laughs> edwards Solaire. Like, you're talking about epic battles. And then everybody forgets, like, a Christian Fulton, right? Christian Fulton, um, who was a second-round pick, right? He's jumping in the mix, going against a Terrace Marshall. Like, they, it, was, it was it was crazy, man. It was crazy. Oh, my God. I wish this was locked on LSU just for, like, 20 more minutes. <laughs> That's wild. It's just like – I mean, it's just like popcorn. It, it's so crazy. So, anyways, that was just a, a selfish aside. So – <laughs> so this is what we call transition, folks. So say um, the Cardinals trade back at seven with Oakland or with with Vegas, okay? Yep. Will Anderson's gone. Jalen Carter's probably gone at five, and whoever Tyree Wilson or I mean, are they looking at are they looking at Christian Gonzalez there? Are they looking at Devin Witherspoon there? I mean, they're not going to draft a wide receiver. Where some teams, I don't know, crazy crazy things happen with wide receivers in the draft. But like, what are you looking at at seven for best player available? Most likely there with all the mocks you've done up and all the research you've done. Yeah. So I think this is right. You know, I talked about that threshold of like a plus to kind of B plus type mm -hmm. players. That's right at the threshold of that situation. And if Christian Gonzalez is there, I say they need to take him. Everything I've seen from this guy, he has track speed. He has smooth hips. He's big. Um, He has ball skills. I, I think he'll probably be the closest thing. In, I'm, I'm not saying this. <laughs> I'm not saying this in car. I know I'm in Cardinals land, right? But yeah, I think he'll be the closest thing at corner that the Cardinals would have seen since like Patrick Peterson, one of those type of high caliber athletes that just simply has ball skills. So if he's there, I think he's one of those guys where it's like, okay, a plug and play. This guy should make a difference immediately uh, next year. For those who are groaning, because there are no relocks, I've talked about this, like, Arizona Cardinals roster. Go look at it, okay? If it's not a punter, a kicker, a tight end, or a quarterback, you draft him where where they pick. It, there's right. not a wrong draft pick. If the Cardinals took and leaped up 10 extra picks to take an offensive lineman at three, you think that that's not going to be beneficial for the Cardinals in the future? Like, the Cardinals need impact players, and they love their DBs from the Pacific Northwest. So it would make a whole lot of sense with Buda Baker and Jalen Thompson over the top. And just because – for those who are on the East Coast right now, you go to sleep before Oregon plays doesn't mean that Christian Gonzalez ain't a baller because he is. Just go yes. go to YouTube. Just go down a rabbit hole of Tyree Wilson and Devin Witherspoon and Christian Gonzalez and these guys who you don't necessarily know because they're not Will Anderson or Jalen Carter that's been shoved down your throat. There is talent in this draft that the Cardinals can definitely draft in the top seven while accumulating future draft capital that is – the final unraveling of all the Travis Sham mockery that Steve kind of put this organization through. Remember, and coach, this is this is the one thing that I like to say. I say smart things sometimes. <laughs> Steve Kime is like your friend when you were five or six years old who would come over, play with all your toys, make a mess, and then leave and not help yes. you pick them up. And yeah. that's what he's done with the Arizona Cardinals. Now, last thing, because this is my dream scenario for the Cardinals, because in my opinion, if they trade out of Will Anderson land, they may as well trade all the way to the end of the first round. Because as you said, it's Will Anderson, there's a couple A plusers, and then everything else, even though you get a grade from B plus to B or whatever, but it's close mm -hmm. enough. If Tennessee does get a stick up their rear end, and they want to give that Trey Lance package to move up to number three and give the Cardinals two future first and whatever, and just if, if that's the move, that that first time GM is going to, is going to take place. I'm calling Jerry Jones and saying, how much do you want B. John Robinson? Right. Because Jerry Jones is a maniac and Jerry <laughs> Jones, you very well know, loves running backs. A Texas running back would be his last gift to the rest of the NFL that would put them in the Ezekiel Elliott room, you know, room, even though B. John Robinson is probably going to be, I mean, he yeah. could be an all timer. Yeah. Do you see Dallas? 
moving up to draft B. John Robinson if it's within 10 or 12 picks? Or do you say, you know what, we'll learn from our mistakes. We'll take the Memphis running back at Tony Pollard and see what happens. No, I agree 100%. And you have to – you think about Jerry Jones in the history, right? You talk about Emma Smith. You talk about Herschel Walker. You talk about Ezekiel Elliott, right? All of these running backs that – not only have been running backs because there's a running back argument, right? Or don't take a running back that high. Well, it depends on what you're using a running back for. The Cowboys, when they drafted Ezekiel Elliott, they got everything out of Ezekiel Elliott. He was worth that first round pick because he ran them to the playoffs multiple times. Mm -hmm. And I think the Dallas Cowboys are in position, even with Tony Pollard, he's more of a slashing type running back, right? Like they are still in position to where they need a bell cow type running back. And if you plan on utilizing B. John Robinson, in that type of capacity, then there's no issue with taking them top 25. There have been multiple um, examples of running backs going high and then running their team to the playoffs. You talk about Todd Gurley with the Los Angeles Rams, right? So I, I think that if I can definitely see the Cowboys, and like you said, it has the right splash. You're talking about Texas, Austin. You're talking about Dallas. You're talking about a trade. You're talking about one of the biggest names, marketable guy. It, it, it sounds like Dallas. <laughs> Why is why is Dallas I, Ross Jackson? I'm sorry, I'm going to go over uh, with Coach here. <laughs> why 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 is Dallas America's team, Coach? Like, listen, rational thinking that would make it seem like the Knicks are America's team in the NBA. Even though you know the Knicks haven't won championships since you know Willis Reed or whatever 50, 60 years ago at this point. But it's like the Cal I don't because their fans are the most maniacal because Jerry Jones has the best circus in town. Like, why are the Cowboys? America's team man that's such a tough it's, it's because I, it, it's flashy it's entertaining right like it's it keeps people on their seat and you simply you love it or you hate it right I think that's why you you love it or you hate it and maybe that's how people feel about America right you love it or you <laughs> hate it <laughs> um but I, I think it's I, I think that's why man it's, it's flashy you're talking about the star you're talking about the colors you're talking about big lights right like it's one of those things where they had the star in the helmet. Everybody wants to be a star. Like, and, and Jerry Jones did a hell of a job of simply marketing that team. I mean, and, and the crazy part is the reason why I bring it up is like there are certain similarities between the the Cowboys and the Cardinals. Like, when the GM, who was Steve Kime, and not Stephen or Jerry. I mean, I know Jerry Jones is the puppet master. Once Steve Kime makes a correct draft pick, which was few and far between, he gave that draft pick all of the money in the second contract. See, I was right, Teron Matthew. Here's $45 million guaranteed. Right. And he asked him to restructure. And that was the bridge burn. Like that, that's what we've dealt with here in Arizona watching. So it's just interesting to watch it with a team that that's marketed a lot better in Jerry Jones. Coach, Coach Keith Th uh, Sanchez, God, easy for me to say at the talent code, senior draft analyst, draft network, locked on NFL draft. Dude, thanks so much for joining me. Oh man, I definitely appreciate it. We definitely have to come on again, man. Absolutely. Alex Nancy, locked on Cardinals. Uh, Mike Sando tomorrow morning. I'll talk to you then.